You're listening to I Have Some Notes, a podcast supported by listeners like you. To contribute, visit patreon.com slash I Have Some Notes. Hey, Greg, I have a pitch for you. A thoughtful sci-fi movie exploring wealth inequality and class consciousness that's also packed with cyberpunk action and a star-studded cast. Oh, wow. That, that sounds really interesting and exciting. Whoa, 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 whoa. No one said anything about this being interesting or exciting. What? Yeah, this movie, boring as hell. Real snooze fest. Uh, I have some notes. Welcome, everyone, to I Have Some Notes, the movie podcast with cuts, keeps, punch-ups, and tweaks on mediocre movies. I'm your host, Liam Kreswick. I'm Scott C. Bourgeois. And I'm Greg Beaver. And today, we are discussing 2023's Elysium. Uh, I just want to apologize right off the top for the quality of my voice. I am fighting a cold. Uh, If I sound huskier or scratchier than normal... Uh, I'm just gonna. If you're getting the it. vapors while you're his- yeah, just, listening to Scott's <laughs> sexy voice, just, just know that it's only it. temporary. <laughs> Alas, only temporary. But yes, I, I I wasn't gonna draw attention to it, but while we're doing that, I guess I'll also apologize off the top. Uh, my cats are shedding, uh, and it's you know spring kicking allergies into gear, so I sound even more nasally and irritating than usual. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. Uh, Scott and I are both reaching uh, uh, the, the, the polar the opposite. extremes, the polar opposites of our, our radio voices. <laughs> so. And Greg is in good health. So great. <laughs> so far. <laughs> Knocking on wood. Yeah. Also, uh, this is going to be an exciting show where we are two weeks into being a podcast with a Discord and a Patreon, and it's going great. Thank you to everyone who's hopped on the Discord. Uh, it's been a lot of fun chatting with all of you. Uh, it's not, you don't have to be a Patreon subscriber to come participate. So we really encourage uh, any of our listeners to come get in on the action. Uh, you can find links to the discord and all the places I have some notes is posting, uh, and tweeting and what have you's. Uh, but if you did want to support us via Patreon, you can check us out. Patreon.com slash I have some notes. And that's also been a, a, a rousing success. Thank you to everyone who has contributed so far. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're looking at some, some perks, some perks for the patreons for the, the patrons Eventually, yeah yeah so uh, <laughs> as as more patrons get in we're gonna we're gonna find more stuff to uh to we're, throw out to them. we're holding all those perks back like those <laughs> filthy rich people on elysium <laughs> you want the perks little sick kids you can't have them <laughs> those are for citizens only <laughs> uh yeah uh, elysium this is my second time watching it i think i saw it in theaters uh i did as uh, well how about you guys Uh, This was my first time. This one passed me by, unfortunately, which is weird because I like trashy cyberpunk movies, and this movie is trashy and cyberpunky, and so it was right up my alley, and I gobbled it up. Now, it's just like your definition of of cyberpunky, does it just generally just involve like the melding of uh, metal and flesh kind of thing. Yeah, like dirty oh, no. sci-fi. <laughs> it's not just dirty sci-fi. Star Wars is dirty sci-fi, and it's not cyberpunk. Um, That's cybernetics is definitely part of it, but it, there's also uh, like a strong class inequality and fighting the man element to cider- cyberpunk. Mm, right, it, right. it needs to be. It needs to be punk, right? And this movie definitely has that vibe. It, it might be a little more space age than like twenty minutes in the future, like a lot of cyberpunk is, but I think it it hit the cyberpunk sweet spot perfectly and it, it was speaking my language and I, I liked it because of that. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, I, uh, didn't like it as compared to district nine, uh, which was a great film when I saw it, I'm reluctant to go back and watch it frankly. Um, but yeah, I remember rushing out to the theater to see this one because of how much I love district nine. And I don't think I disliked it when I saw this originally, but I did realize on watching it a second time, I completely forgot it. I didn't, couldn't tell you anything about it going into it. Um, whereas District 9, even though I watched it the one time, 
when it came out uh, has really stayed with me. It's seared uh, into your brain. Yeah, so that, I think that speaks to the the quality of this movie. Yeah, I think I feel about it the same as when I had first watched it. Like it's it's fine. Um, yeah, I was. I even I don't know. I, I like maybe maybe I'm just more generous in my older age, but I, like I actually ended up uh, giving it a little bit of a bump. <laughs> my uh letterbox score just because like i don't know i like i didn't have i didn't have a bad time watching it um Mm -hmm. i gave it three stars which is gonna be a little bit generous i i yeah i don't know it's it's middle of the road but it felt i i didn't feel like i was just two and a half stars just felt too negative to me that's (laughs) fair it uh, i also gave it i also gave it three stars uh and I know I just said that it's because I like cyberpunk trash, but that's the reason why I gave it three stars is because <laughs> I, I see the flaws in this film. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, I still liked it. So I'm willing to give it a slightly above average. Yeah. I think like, you know, when, uh, when I give something a lower score, it's got to like, you know, I have to it's have, a earn sen- it. I have to have a sense of frustration. Yeah. Like it, like when it, you know, <laughs> Uh, that's how I feel. I like when I when I give things like my I, I, like I don't know how you guys re- review things or when you set your scores or whatever if you have like a system, but mine's like very much on like gut feel until I get past four stars, and then between four and five stars, it has to like it has to meet a certain like level of quality and speak to me personally before I give it like one of those two extra bumps. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't give out five stars willy nilly. I'm pretty stingy with that last star. Oh, I love I love giving out five stars on Letterbox. <laughs> I think I don't know why we're like we're not we're not actual no one on Letterbox is an actual critic. I don't know. No. If you overall like to move like I get that there's no like upper end. Like you can't go higher than five so you gotta save it for the really special ones. Um my criteria for what's just like really special, I guess, is lower. All that being said, I gave this two and a half because uh, it was I, I I was barely entertained by it. Middle um, of the road. It middle of the road. Truly, this and that's what I was going to say a second ago. This is peak. I have some notes material, at least in regards of finding things that are middling. Because this is about as I I would honestly bet there are as many movies better than this as there are worse. It's truly, the <laughs> middlest movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the barometer for all other films. <laughs> all other- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, written and directed by Neil Blomkamp, who uh, did District Nine, uh, which is a masterpiece as far as I remember. I am watching this again. I'm like, maybe it's maybe he's not because he's had a real downward uh, trajectory. His his filmography is a steady race to the bottom. We'll get to that later. Uh, we're, we're talking details here. So yeah, written, directed, Neil Blomkamp. Cast, uh, it's gonna be Matt Damon as Max, Jodie Foster as Delacourt, the bad guy, Charlto Copley as Kruger, Alice Brega as Frey, Diego Luna as Julio, uh, who I was very surprised to see as Andor, as Cassie and Andor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Wagner Mura as Spider. Who played, uh, Pablo Escobar in Narcos. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty solid cast, uh, and they they do fine work with what they have. Do um, they? I kind of think I, so. <laughs> I, I'm, I I yeah, you had mentioned that. Whereas I, other than maybe uh, Charl Charl uh no one else seemed to be really working that hard or having that much fun. I think like, no Wagner, one does a bad job. Wagner Mora but... as Spider, I thought was was pretty electric. Uh, Matt Damon's doing Matt Damon, like he's fine. Jodie mm-hmm. Foster made some strong choices for her character, and I respect <laughs> that. Uh, I thought Charlton Copley was was very uh, menacing as Kruger. I I really dug his like whole mercenary unit. I thought they were all really cool. Uh, it was delightful to see Diego Luna show up, and the only person who was really underserved, I felt, was Alice Braga, and that's. Not her fault. Uh, she just, for someone who's set up at the beginning to be such an important character, doesn't really end up having much to do, and that's kind of a shame. Okay, I'm gonna file that away for notes because that I think we could, yeah. Oh, don't worry. I think I, I think it's safe to say that at the very least, I have some notes about what we could do with Frey. <laughs> Sick. Okay, good. Okay, I won't. <laughs> I won't try to steal. But yeah, it's uh, this movie was a tough one to fix broadly because it doesn't do anything necessarily wrong. Like, there's not a lot that's, like, wrong with it. It's just not particularly 
engaging or well executed or like it lacks a lot of like charm and personality uh for such a movie for a movie with such such deep and interesting themes uh but also i found it specifically hard for me to come up with some notes for this one though i did uh because i was kind of so bored by it i forgot to think pod- i forgot to turn on my podcast brain during and shortly after the movie that i was like oh right i got to talk about this on mic and i couldn't be bothered watching it <laughs> to think about it in that way. <laughs> the yeah. movie, the movie meanders, um, mm-hmm. and the whole like first act feels like prologue. Like it really feels like the movie kicks off an hour in, and that is too long to be setting stuff up. And I can, I totally get why, like you and other people, would be bored with it at that point because it takes forever to get going, and then when it gets going, it it turns into this ultra violent action movie, which it wasn't before. And it kind of start, it, it muddies its own big ideas because it like swerves into this action direction that doesn't quite jive because it wasn't mm-hmm. set up really. It's, it's weird. It, it's everything you said is accurate, except for I felt the other way. I felt the most boring part was the back half. Really? I found all the world building interesting. They're setting up these interesting conflicts, these ideas about like class inequality, who gets the, you know, especially because it's all very much focused on healthcare as the, as the main resource we are seeing there being a disparity in pretty into the world building and the ideas of it. And then it just turns into this dumb, violent action movie. And it's not, I'm not against dumb, violent action movies. It's just like, it really does completely turn halfway through like you said um it's i guess it's just which of the two halves do you find more interesting i think i I don't think either half is bad i think for sure i think the problem is that there there's a stark difference between the first half of the movie and the second half of the movie and you need to find a way to tighten tighten the movie up so that they blend Mm -hmm. so that you're you're getting your action movie right from the start and you're getting your social commentary all the way to the end yeah that's Nailed it. That... Movie fixed. More, more or less was my. my <laughs> See you mind. next so week. We'll, we'll get into that uh, that later because we have we still got to talk about our observations, ideas of it. One observation I want to share with this one is it looks like like the the planet Elysium looks mm-hmm. really good. Some the production design is quite good, but the the space station planet Elysium, especially because so many characters f- enter Elysium by falling through the sky to enter it. Reminds me of Apex Legends, the video game Apex Legends. <laughs> if you've ever played it, the maps look like Elysium, just copy pasted palatial houses that are very open concept and have magical healing devices just laying around. <laughs> are you are you suggesting that Apex Legends is loosely based on Elysium? I wouldn't put it past them. Like truly, <laughs> like the some of the rich people houses are these sort of weird, like oval shape like like a box with rounded corners that's open on both sides and that's like a you know glass on one side glass on the other side and then a rounded edged kind of box rectangle box thing for the walls and the roof it straight up looks like the little houses in apex legends like it's it's very and also the final oh god sorry that that company that gaming company they they created titanfall and mm-hmm. if you've played Titanfall, you'd know that like the little there's little droids running around uh, on the mm-hmm. ground that you just kind of like they're just kind of like uh, little guys that you can just cut down really easily. But they look very much like the cop robots in this movie. Damn. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if there's some creative DNA. Either either creative talent went from yeah. you know one game studio to, into movie into game or whatever. Or just like you wear un- unintentional influence, deliberate influence, but yeah. It, it also, just going to say that the final battle takes place in an armory, but it does mean that there's just random ass weapons lying around. It is like, very is video gamey, yeah. Multiple times through the movie, I look even at the, the last. Like, this is Apex. <laughs> even the last. Uh, there's even a last boss fight on a bridge. Like it's a it's a set piece boss fight. I yeah. I see it. Um, I actually I do like the production design overall. I think that the the very stark difference between uh Elysium's opulence uh and the squalor down on earth in LA is really well 
done. And it really does show like the, it just instantly you can see like the difference between the situation with the haves and the have nots. It's, it's really good. If there's one thing this movie does really well, it's, it's the production design. I think the cybernetics look cool. I think, uh, as I mentioned before, I thought the mercenary team was rad. Um, I thought the production design was quite good. I thought the look of like the future weapons was neat. Like they, they put a lot of thought into how this movie should look and it looks very good. Yeah, I, I would agree, Scott. And I think with that, let's go to the plot summary. I said things haven't changed. This wasn't even my fault. You're still stealing cars? No. Since I got out, I've been trying to live a normal life. You used to be a legend, and now what? Rose the 34! No, no, no! No, no, no! In five years' time, you will die. Thank you for your service. They can fix it on Elysium, man. Max, I think I can help get you up there. Hey, bring down the boom saw! This ain't gonna kill me. What did you do to me? Gave you a way out. Whoever has this has the power to override their whole system. She's very sick, Max. We need to get her up there. You can save everyone. When can I go? In the year 2154, the near-destitute surface dwellers of the Earth struggle to eke out a meager existence. They toil away in a literal robotic police state, working dangerous production lines for the ruling elites. High above the Earth orbits a massive bicycle wheel paradise called... Elysium, whose people want for nothing, especially health care. Each house features its own magic bed, which can cure everything from cancer to crabs, one must assume. Max DaCosta has long dreamed of earning a ticket to Elysium, but a healthy dose of workplace radiation means his dream has become a necessity. With only five days to live, Max turns to his criminal past for help. Fitted with a mech suit to aid his dying body, Max makes a deal to mind heist data from an Elysium citizen in exchange to be smuggled into the orbital habitat. With the plan going south, Max finds himself in the crosshairs of a sociopathic assassin and a politician with the strangest of accents. <laughs> yeah, I did feel like you were being really generous when we were reading out the cast that she was making... <laughs> She was making choices. She was making choices. Like she was making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it really started out kind of like like a like a British accent, and then it kind of just like went away to a North American accent, and then I don't know what else afterwards. It was kind of all over the map. You have very gritted teeth. Like it seems like she never really opened her jaw. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like she hadn't like quite settled on w- how her character should speak before they started filming. I kind of liked it because it made her more hateable. <laughs> like it, it comes across as pretentious. Like it comes ac- across as pretension because she is not just one of the ruling elites. She's one of the elites of the ruling elites. She thinks she is literally better than everyone. And that is ultimately her comeuppance in the end. Uh, and so the fact that she has this pretentious way of speaking, even to the other people who are richy riches living in the rich wheel, it's, she is the smuggest snake in the world and it's, she is so hateable. And I just, I really enjoyed that choice. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause a lot of people, you know, commented about her, her voice. I didn't find it overly distracting or problematic, definitely noticeable, but I didn't take, take issue with it. Uh, but my partner and Amanda and I could not stop laughing at Kruger, Krieger's, Kruger? I think it's Kruger, yeah. Kruger's, uh, um, accent, which was just that guy's, uh, South African accent. <laughs> like, he just has a white guy from South Africa accent, but it, yeah. he's so menacing and he's so over the top that it was kind of silly. It was really hard to take him seriously. Like, we were having fun with it. I don't even think it's a complaint, but it just, every time that guy talked, we giggled. <laughs> for the whole last act. It's kind of what kept us engaged in the last it, act. It is interesting because his accent is almost incongruous with his character, which yeah, that's precisely which is, what it is, which is interesting. Like uh, the best way I could liken it to is if you had a villain who had like Reese Darby's accent. Yeah. But was, the, but yeah. was supposed <laughs> to be like a, like a crazy, 
like mean villain and it's just the voice isn't quite matching the visual and there are there are definitely movies that have tried to have a villain with a silly voice and failed because they were doing it deliberately and this one succeeds because no one was doing it deliberately no it and it absolutely does because kruger is a very scary character yeah like you uh when he gets his hands on uh on Frey and her daughter, like I was legitimately scared for them. <laughs> I was like, that man that is a bad man, and he's going to do bad things to those people who do not deserve it. And then he gets his face blown off. And <laughs> I mean, that was a thing that happened, and I was like, Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the violence, it's it's like you're saying, it's very incongruent with the first half of this movie. This movie is full of incongruities. Just like those two <laughs> things shouldn't go up against each other. Um, yeah. And yeah, it gets wickedly violent in the last half in a way that isn't really present in the first half. That again oh. is just like a real tonal whiplash. Just quickly on uh, Charlton Copley again. Uh, he, I, I, I wish he was in a lot more things um, because he's a really interesting, uh, talented actor. And he yeah. kind of tends to stand out in whatever he's in, even though he's been chiefly in mediocre movies. Like we, he was in a team, which we did, I think first season. Uh, yeah, I wasn't, I was not part of a team. <laughs> so that's pre me. And, uh, you know, he was great in that he was, um, he was playing face, I believe. Um, yeah. And just, he's stood out. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, just unfortunate that we don't see him more often. Yeah, he. I mean, obviously he works with Neil Blomkamp quite a bit. Yep. Um, and that's something I alluded to earlier that I, I feel needs to be addressed. District 9 is great. Elysium is fine. Chappie is pretty bad, and I have actually been asking to do it for <laughs> months on this podcast. And then Greg's like, what if we do Elysium? I'm like, are you making fun of me? <laughs> um, <laughs> We're working up to it. I guess we got to work our way up to it. And apparently his most recent movie called Demonic is like almost unwatchable. And it's just very – I don't think I've ever seen a director with such a steady de- – like steady decline in quality. Hem night. That like truly uh, – Excuse me. <laughs> So yeah, everyone. We said Scott's not feeling well. He's got some Shyamalan in his throat. <laughs> in fairness to M Night Shyamalan, like yeah, he hit it out of the park with his first one, and then kind of meandered. He's had some okay movies in the mix, though. So maybe Blomkamp just needs to like find that again. He needs to find that groove again. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I mean, I've, he's I've... he's a director who's got ideas, and that's not bad it's just yeah. he needs to he needs to tweak it and find a way to execute better maybe my understanding is that um there was a lot of district nine was was improved and i believe mm-hmm. this was the first his first truly scripted movie um i hope that's correct i'm not i i, I didn't I, look I, it up before the show yes we are definitely talking about this but i think you are correct yeah so i i just wonder if this is just a case of like um, either either someone who's a little bit green with a pen, or maybe, uh, you know, maybe the talent's not quite there on the writing side, and they need to stick to a little bit more directing or get help with their screenplays. Could be, could be one of those. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I like. I, I'm not trying to. By, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to dump on on Neil Blomkamp here, yeah. uh, because again. He's got good ideas, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and I want to see more movies from him, and I want them to get better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at the heart of Chappie are some really interesting ideas about AI and you know what it means to exist and perceive. And at the heart of but this it, movie, there's some good ideas too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love I love the idea. I love what this movie sets out to do. Truly and deeply, <laughs> this is some leftist cla- class consciousness. Comrade Elysium is here to unite the people, um, right? Especially the scene at the end when he types in "all citizens colon legal." <laughs> I, I just on that um, one of the things that I felt maybe um, undercut the whole conflict between the classes in this movie was that we didn't really get a sense of who lived on Elysium, what those people were like outside. Like, I mean, obviously we have Delacorte who's played by Mm -hmm. Jodie Foster. Who's the villainous security secretary. 
but she's in opposition to the rest of the Elysium Council, you know, Mm -hmm. and like, like, so she feels somewhat isolated in her villainousness. Um, yeah, and our only representative, yeah, and our only, our only touch, our only touch point with the rest of the Elysium citizens are these other people who are opposed to her. So it doesn't, you don't get this, this greater like class conflict sense outside of the fact that like the visuals clue you into that. And the fact that like occasionally there's like someone sitting in a pool on Elysium and obviously they're not sitting in pools on earth. Right. Um, But you, you just don't, you just don't really meet anybody to really hammer that home or get a sense of what life is like on the planet and how people generally feel about mm-hmm. potential immigration and those types of things. Yeah. The, we, the movie might even benefit from having another POV character on Elysium, uh, but who isn't one of the villains necessarily, mm-hmm. like who's obviously benefiting from a villainous system, maybe doesn't realize that at first. And their character arc is to realize how unjust things are. And then, help Max to change it in the end. Uh, But maybe that's something that's missing because that would give us more time on the space station and give us more time immersed in that culture as well. So we can really see the difference between Elysium and, and Los Angeles on earth. Weirdly, the, the person, at least with what's on the paper or what's in the script to fill that role is the president is the guy who uh, Jodie Foster's all pissed off at and won't let her off her leash. Yeah. Kind of. He and that's you know yeah I don't know if he is in a, in any kind of a fix the right guy but he's he's the closest to another Elysian that we get the perspective of yeah yep either like either that or you know we get a some kind of scene where she's you know at a fundraiser or something and is smoozing yeah. with a general public and you know we we pick up through them how they feel about the relationship yeah. with earth like very simple but i mean that that would you know that would just be a one scene and there was there was a scene where she was at some sort of function but we only really see things through her perspective we don't we don't really talk yeah. with a lot of other uh, yeah. citizens uh, of elysium unfortunately. And, and her perspective is extreme like she's she's an extremist yeah. who wants who wants to be even more oppressive to the people of earth and it's it would be good to have a point of view that's not that's just the kind of the standard elysium if that makes sense the yeah. regular the regular guy on the on the wheel as opposed to this like snooty elitist who is so elite that she wants to be even more elite i don't know if i would yeah. even call her snooty she's just kind of evil oh no she she's, just she's put on an accent those... to be snooty <laughs> <laughs> but she's like she just wants to blow ships up you know she's not um yeah she doesn't No, she like wants she wants to step hoity. on the neck of the people of earth even more yeah she she wants to control the boot and then she wants the boot to kick even more ass and if if her whole thing is that like you know getting off on the power of being the boot and not the the stomped if we spend more time with other people from Elysium, we also might learn something that I kind of found very distracting. Um, I don't care that they don't explain how the beds work or even how they're powered. Uh, I also don't care that they, um, like I was, I was talking with a, with a man about how like, well, wouldn't like first generations of this technology like exist on earth? Like mm. nothing even close to these beds is on earth. I'm okay with that as well. Don't need that. But what I wish they would have delved into and explained is why Elysium is withholding this specific resource from Earth. Like, food I get. It's finite. Uh, air, clean water. It's, those are all finite things. Power could very well be finite, even if it's, like, solar power. Like, hauling the batteries down, there might be a problem. But, like, this seems to be a magic bed. Why are they so unwilling to share it with Earth? That is never addressed or brought up, and if we maybe met an everyday Elysian, we would learn mm-hmm. why they don't share yeah. this gift. And it, it's got like Inter- interestingly, I'm, my repitch may actually solve this issue for you. <laughs> sick. <laughs> and it's it's in, indicative of like you know our times. Like there are people in the world who are sick and need medicine, and yep. 
you know, Scott and I are well enough to, to t- do a podcast. Like, we have medicine we're not sharing technically, but, like, I'm not, like, holding it. I'm not like, you guys can't have it. We're having it. And especially because the, these ma- these beds are, are almost magic. They don't – they just seem to be – like, you wave a wand and people are better. Like, why wouldn't you send some of that down to earth? Like, well, Especially and, if and you I'm want sure to work a reason. for it. Yeah. I'd love to hear that reason. Yeah, that's, I would love yeah, to hear the villains the, tell me that reason. Yeah, that is the very funny thing about it is, like, is that it would – it seems to almost have the ability to bring people back to life. And, like, it, if you wanted an endless workforce who are going to jump into, like – potentially extremely dangerous situations where they could be completely irradiated then yeah having one though one one of those in the workplace would just like save you a lot of time and money yeah they got the robots they got the they got the next stepping robots why can't they even if it was like a weird like there's one per town or something like, i don't know it just yeah i mean we're uh, i mean i guess we're approaching it on the on the the assumption that, like this hyper capitalistic society would be rational and we know full well that capitalism is not rational so <laughs> i i guess even if that's the case i would have just loved to have heard it either explicitly or in subtext but the the movie does not seem interested in explaining why they are withholding it they're just like they're evil so they're not going to share their medicine that's how it feels yeah yeah, I agree yeah. with that. I was thinking, because um, we had touched on Matt Damon's performance. Like Scott had said earlier that it was very Matt Damon. But interestingly, I thought that the character initially had like some interesting swagger. Like when he was sassing the robot cops when they're giving him hassle um, you know, before he went to work or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like... It it felt like kind of like a little bit of a different Matt Damon at that point, but once once he gets ill, it's kind of like then it becomes kind of standard Matt Damon. Interestingly, which is kind of unfortunate that he just sort of lo- he just sort of lost that swagger. I, I think that's there's a lot of things in this movie where it's just the um, I, I think you called it joyless and uh either in the chat or one of your reviews liam but uh, i i think that's a fair assessment like it's just like yeah, yeah. aside from charlotte copley you know hamming it up while he's uh firing firing away at uh at his uh assassin marks right like the, outside of that like yeah it's pretty it feels pretty Tr- yeah, charmless yeah is, is no you know yeah i i would i'd be inclined to agree Let's uh, let's get into our fixes, though. I, I think uh, maybe we have a little more here to work with uh, than perhaps we thought when we started recording. It's been an enlightening conversation, so we'll be back with our fixes for Elysium. I'd like to get more reading done, and joining a book club seems like a good idea, but I don't know. Well, why not? Reading a whole book in a month, that's pretty daunting. What if it was just a chapter, say, a week? That doesn't sound too bad. Still, getting together with a bunch of people, that's a whole evening. Well, what if it was only half an hour, whenever you wanted to? That would be great. The Read Along, a mini book club for your ears. Join my wife, Anita. And my husband, Scott. As we take you on a journey through a good book, one one chapter chapter at at a time. time. Available right now on your podcatcher of choice. Welcome back to I Have Some Notes. We're talking Elysium, and uh, before we get into our fixes specifically, Greg has some ideas he wants to kick off. Before the break, I said something I realized was kind of (laughs) stupid, and I would like to correct it as I've thought about it. The folks of the global north in our real world, the folks of the, the West actually do hoard medicine when i was thinking about <laughs> vaccine rollout i was like yeah. oh wait no yeah. we, we totally hoard medicine <laughs> um correct <laughs> stand corrected i had to think about that for a second you know it's um, entirely possible that like someone holds the patent to that technology and they get like a little kickback every time it's used and the people of earth just can't afford the ip yeah, yeah. it's got to be yeah. the same reason yeah. you know this for the same bullshit reasons the vaccine wasn't rolled out evenly worldwide has got to be the same reason yeah. those beds weren't rolled out universe wide um so but I, I stand by my point that I would have liked the movie to explore yeah. why that was the yeah. case, but I realized I just had to correct myself. We absolutely are just <laughs> the the banality of evil. We hoard medicine, whether we know we're doing it or not. Yeah, I, I think that that we have to like head candidate is not uh, a good point for the for the movie, right? Like, yeah, yeah it seems it seems like something that that um, should be explicit warrants a little bit of exp- explanation for sure. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Anyway, like uh, Elysium to me has all the tools 
to be a fine <laughs> action movie and and say something about the struggle of the working class and this capitalist hellscape in which we currently all inhabit. Uh, so here's how we do that. First of all, uh, Max is not a former criminal, uh, and he sure as shit isn't another white dude uh, with a destiny. You know, um, <laughs> I hate that shit. <laughs> so uh, Max is just like an a, like an unremarkable nobody trying to play by the rules. He works excessively long shifts uh, in the factory. He's he's certain his hard work will be rewarded with uh, uh, Elysium citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, like, we, we see propaganda throughout the city proselytizing to the people of Earth that, you know, if they work hard enough, if you just, like, you know, pull up your bootstraps, um, then you'll earn a ticket to paradise, right? And mm -hmm. it's a lie, of course. In reality, like, sustaining the orbital space station requires so much of Earth's resources that any increase to its population would mean an end to Elysium's comfortable and privileged lifestyle. Um, Max's eagerness to please his bosses leads him to be mortally injured like he is in the movie proper, um, at which point he learns just how disposable he is to Elysium. And now he's got to make it to into orbit and visit the magical Elysium medical facility or die. Mm -hmm. um, so he seeks out his childhood friend, Frey, who has been leading a band of uh, like space coyotes who are been trying to unsuccessfully smuggle people aboard uh, Elysium for years. Then Frey convinces Max to pull the mine heist for a chance uh, for all of them, including her sick daughter, daughter to make it Elysium. So I'm just kind of like doing a little bit of a, a character shift here. Um, sure. And then I'll, we'll catch up with another character shift in a second here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Delacorte is, is fighting growing calls for reform as a group of revolutionaries on Elysium seek more equitable, sustainable relationship with earth. They, <laughs> She's convinced that, like, reform would end her way of life, and that's why she's plotting to, like, a hostile takeover of the government, and then she needs, you know, the information from Max's mind that he's stolen to do that. Then Max and Frey are caught when they smuggle themselves to Elysium, but the revolutionaries break them out and help them hack the system and dissolve all the security barriers. When they seek out the medical treatment, they learn from the revolutionaries that the magic beds aren't real. Like everything else about that they've been told about Elysium, they're just a lie. Um, they, the elites never had them. It was just another propaganda tool and like psych for psychological yeah, control, yeah. right? So the film ends on a shot of Max resigned to his fate, watching his ships of desperate immigrants land on Elysium. So I don't know well, if I necessarily you've decided, quite <laughs> stuck You've decided to it. give us give us uh, the bleakest possible ending as opposed to <laughs> uh as opposed to any sort of hopeful change yes, to the system. I, I, the, I think the reason I did that is like that I, you know, I I, I think for me like the, my my thrust the thrust of my idea was that the worker struggle against uh, like like working within the system doesn't work right yeah like like you need to you need to like fight back and like they're they're always going to screw you in every possible way and like even at the end of even at the end of my movie uh max is still screwed by the system even though he helps to try like to dismantle it no i i dig it um uh, I think you, I could go either way on the ending. I'm not sure how I feel about the ending, but everything you said up to that, I am very much in. I, I like, sorry, finish your thought, Liam. Uh, and yeah, I, well, I just want to, I want to piggyback off that because I think what, what Greg has outlined is where I can put my kind of broader fix. Um, but if we're still kind of, I don't want to get into my shit, uh, let's keep picking apart what Greg said. What do you got? Well, I, I just want to say, uh, first of all, I like that this gives, uh, Frey more to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, I feel like she was very underserved in the uh, in the actual movie. Um, it really ties into her motivation for wanting to get help for her daughter, 
uh, for her to be like kind of leading this revolutionary movement from Earth. And I think you didn't say it outright, but I think that you're moving Spider onto Elysium. He's That's the leader correct. of the, he's the revolutionary. Yeah. He's the leader of the revolutionaries. Like he's a he's a computer hacker. He's a young one of the like younger generation who's coming up on Elysium, and he sees the inequality and he wants to fix it. Um, so I do like that. I still think um, Delacour needs to sit Kruger on all of the people that she's enemies with, really. Um, first on Earth against Max and Frey when he does the data heist. Uh, and then when they get up to Elysium uh, and Kruger is really off the leash, then Spider and his revolutionaries come under fire, too. And even the, yeah. the people in the – because she unleashes a monster in paradise, basically. Yeah. So now even the people up in heaven are getting killed by a demon. Ooh, that, like, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because he's a monster and he's, and she has no, she thinks she has control over him and she doesn't. And that's part of her hubris. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I actually really like your fixes and it, it effectively nullifies what I was going to suggest because I was going to suggest something for Frey that this absolutely fixes. I much prefer your fix. (laughs) I do disagree with your bleak ending though. I think the movie wants to have a more hopeful ending and I feel like it's more in tune with the original ending of the movie for there to like the, the riches have to have some kind of advanced medical technology uh, just because they're rich and they want to look pretty and live long and they've got to have it. So even if it's not something that magically can fix a person's face from being blown off, mm-hmm. they they have to have some kind of medicine that can help people who are desperately sick, like Max. I think I think I agree that Max should still die in the end. I, that's the way the movie works. I think that he him sacrificing himself functions. Like he he helps other people get to a heaven that he'll never be able to experience because of the violence he enacted to get there. I I like that that's kind of his character arc. Um, but I think that f- like for Frey and her daughter and other sick people, like they should be able to get that medical help. And Spider's there to help them get it. So yeah, I. Uh... I, I keep going back to what Scott said about what Greg said, where you're moving Spider to Elysium. Um, I think that solves that problem we were talking about in the first half of uh, having another uh, uh, Elysium local to be a point of view character, uh, to not only be uh, juxtaposed Delacorte, but to s- still also show that the people on Elysium have these great many flaws, but are not incapable of change and compassion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and it, so. it shows that not everyone on Elysium is completely oblivious to what's going on on earth. And that there are differing points of view there. Like you've got the president who's just like a status quo dude. He's the centrist. You've got Delacour. Who's the far right person who wants to stomp even harder with the boot. And you've got spider. Who's like, Hey, we're rich and we have everything and there are people suffering and we could help them. Mm-hmm. Why aren't we? What is wrong with us? Like, I, I, I like that. I like that. It gives us different, different opposing views on the station. And then you also have different opposing views on the earth. Max is the guy who's just keeping his head down and trying to do yeah. good by the system. Frey is there trying to like fight the power and, and get people the help they need from the other side is spider and the two of them, when they meet, they realize they're, yeah. they're on the same side. And that, that also puts Julio in a, in a interesting position um, because he's, he, he basically gets to do what he does in Andor, which is help Andy circus realize that like playing by the system's rules, isn't going to help you spoilers for Andor <laughs> uh, and is part of what ignites the fire under the protagonist's ass. Under Max, yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he you know, um, he plays Andor in this too, and and uh, Max is is the the Andy Circus, you know, last to it was Andy Circus in, yep, Andor, right? Okay, good. Yep. Um, last go. Um, that's that's great, and I can take everything you guys said uh, and use that to actually give something spe- some specific form to my pretty general note, which was just the tonal inconsistency between the first half and the second half. First half of this movie. Thoughtful, interesting sci-fi premises, second half, brainless action. Nothing wrong with either, nothing wrong with the movie at large, but that needs to be evened out. Yeah. And taking what you guys just said, my my, my broad note was going to be, just put an action scene in the beginning, 
and have more interesting explorations of the themes at the end. Having Spider be on Elysium does that. That second part, the this the thoughtful, class conscious themes carry through. If you've got Spider on Elysium, kind of like carrying that torch right up to the end. Great. Yeah. Action scene in the beginning, big Bond style, like starts off with some bombastic, violent action, so that it's not totally jarring when it happens an hour into the movie. This is my pitch for that opening action scene. Max is on his way to work. Um, he's just trying to keep his head down. He's trying to do his job. He's soaking up the propaganda, dreaming of Elysium. I love that, Greg. I love the propaganda angle. It's so <laughs> sick. Um, and in the background, there are freedom fighters. There are rebels. Same, like, with connection to Elysium, like, Spider's Earth um, equivalent. Yeah. Are clashing with the authoritarians on Earth, the robots, the 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 corporate guys, and literally Max is just trying to get to work, and he's like, um, it's almost comedic how he's like dodging this violence and fully putting on blinders to not notice it, and it doesn't really hit home for him, or he doesn't really have to go face to face with it until he gets roped into it, kind of like he does in the movie where he has to start answering for a crime he didn't do to the robot. And also when he meets Freya, he's like, oh, it's this woman I used to love. She's in this fight. What are you doing? And like Freya and Julio can kind of bring him into the fold when he's still like the last one to be like, no, no, no. Got to gotta just keep my head down, play by the system. But that just to, just to have some action at the beginning, have revolutionary combat in the background while this guy is actively trying to ignore it and play within <laughs> the rules. I, I'll do you one better. Uh, keep that. But you can have an even earlier action beat when Max and Frey are kids, mm, uh, yeah. which could explain why they're orphans. You mm. could have you could mm. have like robots from Elysium doing a crackdown on Earth, and maybe their parents get killed in it, and that's why the two of them end up in this <gasps> in this orphanage, and how they meet and become friends. Yeah, and you know what they're cracking down on? You know what those robots? They're trying to wrangle up all the first generation magic beds to take them to Elysium, <laughs> and we get an explanation of why they won't share the magic beds. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I a do, little too far. I do like yeah, I, I like, do like, I like that, that. Uh, Max and Frey uh, both like learn different lessons from it. Like he he learns to keep his head down, and she she learns that you know she has to she has to fight for for to save herself. Yeah, yeah, that's that's sick. But yeah, that no, I, that was I my my pitch I like is action at the beginning to even it all out. I like Liam's action beat. I like my action beat. It puts a little more violence in the beginning of the movie, so that it's not like a jarring tonal shift in the back half of the movie when Max is dressed in a cyber suit and punching mercenaries through walls, <laughs> blowing people's jaws off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and also people in, in the Chappie face. too where there's very little violence in Chappie and then in like with 20 minutes left in the movie Hugh Jackman like rips a guy in half and you're like what where did that come from this is yeah guys we did it like Greg you had a you had a solid fix for this movie and then we I, just kind of like filled in the blanks <laughs> Mad Lib style that's funny about that this, is I literally I wrote it like about about a half hour before we started recording <laughs> Well, it's even like I said, this is peak, peak I have some notes material in that it's middling. And I'm like, no, we actually, we got it. We, Greg, Greg came with a pitch. Scott ran with it. I took the baton, yeah. put a bow on it. I like our options. This was. Well, I, I, I did. Re I really enjoyed just like sitting back and just listening to you guys just like add, add bits and pieces uh, continually to it. It was, it was great. Yeah. This was this was peak. I have some nosing. I, I probably shouldn't be too self congratulatory. I'm sure our listeners are cringing. Like you guys aren't geniuses. Shut up. <laughs> no, we um, we are always working with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just feeling pretty good with how these this this rewrite these notes came together. It was very organic, and I I had a lot of fun uh, figuring that out. Also had a lot of fun reading your listener comments. Thank you to everyone who commented. Uh, we can follow us on Twitter at I have some notes. You can join our Discord server, the link to which is uh, on Twitter at I have some notes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to be a Patreon subscriber, we will definitely be prioritizing uh, Patreon comments. Uh, though generally, we, we, we rarely cut comments we're given. Um, but if there ever has to be 
some sort of Elysium style decision of who gets to <laughs> who gets to have their comments read and who doesn't. It's those. All right. So the first uh, comment is from Patreon supporter Robin who says, I'm trying to gather my thoughts, and the crux is that the movie is slow and aimless until he gets to orbit, and then it's kind of rad for a minute. It has lots of ideas about class, but like most of his movies, the idea is lost in the execution. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty fair assessment. Yeah, I think we're kind of on the same page as Robin on that one. Aaron, friend of the podcast, says, I wonder if the movie would be more focused if they'd focused more on the heist aspect a bit more. Also, I think if during the data theft, it came to light that Elysium's resources were stretched way too thin, it would have given Jodie Foster more of a reason to be such an asshole. The speech she gives the president about, do you have children, really doesn't make any sense when everything on Elysium seems pretty perfect other than some pores crashing into the lawn and wrecking a wine tasting a couple of times. It's (laughs) fine and good that the ultra-rich are portrayed as straight evil, but I also like when they're shown as very stupid or (laughs) overambitious. Also, everybody should have had Jodie Foster's weird accent. After a couple of generations on an exclusive space station, I think everyone should have a weird rich guy space station accent. (laughs) Kind of like the Belter accent from The Expanse, but everyone sounds like the rich guy from Gilligan's Island. (laughs) I say, (laughs) what are the poors down on Earth doing today? Hmm. Now that would be a bold choice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the scene with the with the president really goes nowhere. Like it doesn't like other than just to show that she's the most extreme person on yeah. Elysium, but it 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 doesn't do a good job of showing that she's more extreme than these extremely dickish rich people. It just shows that she's most extreme in relation to like yeah, like some status quo kind of like reasonable rich guy. Like Yeah. Yeah. She also doesn't get a moment where she like truly turns on all of them and they realize yeah. who who they're actually dealing with you know that seems yeah. like that's a missed moment yeah that yeah, she, she should she should get exposed before kruger kills her yeah some some political comeuppance absolutely yeah i think i think that should be added into our fix spider should have like a recording of her and like the the chief executive of the evil corporation who they mind heist uh, like plotting and and he like reveals that he was going to use it for like political blackmail, but when when everything hits the fan, he uses that to turn public opinion against her. It's part of the file. It's part of the mind heist file. Yeah, that was the too. guy. The guy was there. The guy said it. He was half the conversation. Yeah, <laughs> so, if they yeah. if they ripped out his brain digitally, then then yeah, Spider would have that information as soon as yeah. he downloads everything from. Uh, Except that she's already dead at that point. I don't know. There's there's a way to do it. I think that, that that should definitely factor in, though. All right. Alex J. Brady says, Matt fails and Alice Braga gets mech suited up and goes full Ripley. <laughs> yeah. Hard to argue with that, Tig. Tack says, my report, Elysium is a 2013 Hollywood movie. It stars several Hollywood actors and is about society. I think it had some good ideas, but I did not finish the assignment. <laughs> While I could not come up with anything it did wrong, I lost interest and watched 24 instead. <laughs> Thus, I robbed a streaming corporation of three to four commercial breaks worth of revenue. And is that not the true message of this movie? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't finish it. I hope this qualifies for a C minus. Thank. Flips page over. You. <laughs> Um, talking about the the ad break, was this? Um, I guess like is is Netflix doing an ad based thing? Is there free Netflix? Oh yeah, yeah there no, there's a there's like a ad tier. Yeah. So, oh yeah, I like think an, if an you pay like I don't know what the cost is, it's like six or eight bucks, and yeah, you get ads. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, yeah I'm still still paying for it like a chump. <laughs> um, so, I would I would have canceled it if we weren't using it for the podcast. Honestly, nice. Um, speaking of Netflix though, I think it is interesting the way Netflix uh, and any of these streaming services, but it seems to happen more on Netflix will add old movies to their libraries, put them front and center on the home page, and breathe a weird new kind of life into them. That the closest analogy I could think of would be kind of like when you'd watch movies on cable and they'd be like, oh, it's always a good Friday night movie, but damn, they got that one. That one only came out like two years ago. Damn. Like, um, because my, uh, friend of the pod, uh, Robin Slack, uh, and, and his wife and his band 
were performing in a bar recently, and they were telling me about this. The bar just put the movie on in the background, um, because it's the kind of bar that doesn't do sports, just puts on random ass movies. And it definitely had the vibe of like someone just was like, put on a movie on Netflix, who cares? This was on the front page. So like within the last week, Robin watched this movie in chunk silently at the bar. <laughs> uh, and so I got to explain some of the context to him. Like he was laughing about the how it's like citizens legal. Um, <laughs> kind of made a chuckle. Um, but it's just like th- this movie is now back in the cultural zeitgeist because it's one of the top 10 movies on Netflix in Canada even though it's a decade old and kind of shitty. <laughs> like it's, it's just very strange. I've seen that happen with a couple of movies where everyone's, everyone's talking about it mostly just cause it got added to Netflix and yeah. we all have Netflix, it's not like cause a, it a very deserves, brief Renaissance. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't deserve a Renaissance. It just was the, <laughs> the least shitty movie in the batch of ones they added this month. Yeah. Sean McKnight says Elysium isn't a space station, it's the island continent of the same name on a partially terraformed Mars, and the entire film takes place there rather than on Earth. Our protagonist is one of millions of people who have been victims of transportation, a policy in which people are forcibly deported to Mars to work as indentured laborers as punishment for crimes. That's just a part of Sean McKnight's uh, essay like page one rewrite of this <laughs> film. Uh, we will link the full thread in the show notes. If you want to read more, it is really quite fascinating and good, but it is very big in scope. And we do not have an entire separate podcast to go through it <laughs> point by point. But yeah, love, love the enthusiasm. Please keep sharing your thoughts like that. Um, Cause there, it, it gives us lots to think about. We appreciate you getting as excited to fix a movie as we do. So thank you very much, Sean. Uh, for your your very long and thoughtful comment and everyone else's short and thoughtful comments. Uh, We appreciate them, one and all. Yeah, I think we fixed a movie, guys. That's what we do here on I Have Some Notes. And, of course, one of the things you can do is follow us on social media, facebook.com slash I Have Some Notes, uh, at I Have Some Notes on Twitter, patreon.com slash I Have Some Notes if you want to support us financially uh, and be first in line when we think of some perks to give you. Uh, and really just uh, link tree slash I Have Some Notes for all of the places you can find us, including the Discord server, which I please implore you to come and join if you're a Discord user. There's some great movie conversations happening there just between me, Scott, Greg, and our listeners. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I definitely don't need another thing to look at when I should be working, <laughs> but I got one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and of course, crazy. wherever it is you're listening to this, uh, subscribe, rate, review on your pod catcher of choice. Yeah, uh, obviously we are no longer members of the now defunct Alberta Podcast Network, but there were a lot of great podcasts that also could use a bump right now. Um, You can still find all of those podcasts listed on the legacy page, uh, albertapodcastnetwork.com. Check them out. Find them on your podcatcher of choice, especially the Read Along, my other podcast. And if you support, I have some notes uh, that does indirectly support the Read Along as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, and join us again in two weeks when we'll be reviewing Bullet Train. Uh, so head over to the uh, the Discord server if you want to get in your notes early for that Brad Pitt flick. Mm-hmm. Until then, I'm your host, Liam Kreswick. I'm Scott C. Bourgeois. I'm Greg Beaver. Keep watching the skies!